Okay, we're working on the fourth reflection uh, seismic reflection lecture here, and we're starting on uh, at this point on uh, page twelve of the seismic three uh, uh, notes. And um, just as a reminder, we are working on uh, taking um, data that we we have as uh, a collection of um, pure sounding surveys, and we're putting them together into a, uh, a profile. So, uh, at some some places, like uh, in uh, in lakes and 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 oceans, uh, we can do pure profiling, where we just uh, take zero offset data uh, from one place to the next, and make a very simple uh, you know single channel. Uh, single folds uh, section of uh, of where reflections are in time. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, our zero offset data on land are typically contaminated very heavily by the uh, uh, the surface waves and and air waves from our our very noisy seismic sources, and so we have to bring in other um, offsets. So we take our uh, um, our surveys as a whole series, you know, of profiling with a whole series of different offsets, which we tend to do by uh, recording one source into a large number of receivers, and each of those experiments, each of those sources, gives us one shot gather, and that shot gather might have offsets between zero and uh, maybe ten kilometers for a uh, a very deep survey. Uh, or for the surveys that we'll do in class, um, zero to um, uh, to two hundred meters at the most, and we'll take those um, uh, all of those uh, traces, and we'll try to stretch the time to reduce them down to uh, to zero offset. Okay, what would be the time of that reflection, and we'll correct the uh, reflection hyperbola back up to zero offset. This means we're going to be able to sum a whole and stack a whole bunch of uh, different traces from different offsets all around the same midpoint into a uh, uh, into one trace into one zero offset stack trace. So that's how we try to emulate zero offset pure profiling surveys, uh, which we can do easily enough on uh, in the marine environment. That's how we try to emulate it with. Um, the kinds of multi-offset surveys that we do on land, and this stacking chart here uh, tells you how to arrange the traces from your shot gathers, which is how we collect the data in the field, uh, and from that sort out the uh, CDP gathers or common midpoint gathers, CMP gathers. Uh, so in each uh, in each row of this. Um, uh, in each row of, of this um, um, stacking chart, we have um, um, we have all the traces at the whole range of offsets from zero offset to 100 meters offset uh, that are um, recorded uh, at from this source. And in this, in the case of this row, the source is located at uh, 90 meters. And so the receivers are located at 90 plus 0, or 90 meters, to 90 plus 100, or 190 meters. And uh, this chart shows you how you can find all of the traces that are uh, at one midpoint. So for instance, the 100 meter uh, midpoint uh, in this stacking chart, you can find at the um, 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 uh, along this uh, this tilted line here, okay. Because if you have uh, the source at 50 meters, and the uh, and the 100 meter offset, okay. So uh, the midpoint is is at 50 plus 50 meters or 100 meters. So that's there. If you have uh, the source at 100 meters uh, plus zero offset, then the midpoint is at 100 meters. So you connect those two points with the line, and also all the traces that fall. On that uh, midpoint, uh, on that line, will be from that 100 meter midpoint. And then, if you want to take lines parallel to that, that's going to be all the traces that fall 
on some other midpoint, and you can then arrange the uh, perpendicular midpoint axis, which shows you, uh, you know, where the traces are for a midpoint at any position between zero, and in this case, 150 uh, meters distance. And then how many traces that you uh, uh, can sum up is kind of given by the width of the line. You know, how much the line uh, crosses the uh, uh, through the data cube. And uh, you can see here it's about uh, 21 traces uh, at that 100 meter midpoint. Uh, and the maximum fold you can ever have, um, you know, this is for a li fairly limited survey, this, this uh, square stacking chart here. Um, the maximum fold you could ever have, the maximum number of traces that, that would be at each midpoint, is uh, given by this equation up here, 1 half the number of geophones per shot times the distance between the geophones, the spacing between the geophones, divided by the, uh, uh, the spacing between the shots. So you know, like in this stacking chart here, the spacing between the shots is equal to the spacing between the geophones. So really, uh, we had, um, I think in this case, 50 uh, geophones per, uh, uh, per shot recorded. And so uh, we ng is uh, 50, and half of that is 25. So the maximum fold is 25. And you can see that there is a certain range of midpoints at about 75. Uh, the midpoint x equals 75, where we would be at, uh, or maybe uh, 60, where we would be at that maximum um, uh, fold of 25. So now let's um, take some nice, clean, synthetic data. and. Uh, uh, put that together. So uh, being synthetic data, we can look at the zero offset traces, and it looks uh, like a chirp survey. All right, so we have a, a time section here, time, two-way travel time from uh, reflection travel time from zero to 150 milliseconds at the bottom. And uh, across here, um, the uh, midpoint x, the location, is from zero to 100 meters. Okay, we have our own coordinate system for this survey. And you can see the, uh, the top reflector, and it's multiple at, at exactly twice the time. And then you can see the uh, dipping reflector uh, down here and the flat reflector at the bottom Okay, from the model that I showed you in the last lecture. Um, now, trouble is, uh, you know, here are the zero offset traces from a uh, you know, not too bad uh, land data set recorded by the class many years ago. And um, you know we can uh, uh, we can see that there are uh, uh, we don't have exactly zero um, exactly zero uh, um, uh, um, distance between the the source and the receiver, but it's close. Uh, and and this kind of uh, zero offset data set, you can you can pick those um, uh, zero you know near zero offset times. And you can actually get the service velocity from that easily enough. Just take the uh, the minimum offset distance that uh, that you have, and uh, divide it by the uh, uh, the time at each trace. And you can see that the velocity varies a bit. Um, you know, some places it, the time is very soon, so it's uh, it's uh, um, fast, and and other places uh, the time is later, so it's slow. Uh, but looking down on the rest of the section, you know, it really looks just like noise. It's, and this is really the Rayleigh waves and the air waves coming straight from the um, the source to that nearby receiver. And you know, other than being able to interpret the P wave, we really can't see any of the subsurface reflections in here. So that's why um, we try to emulate that true pure profiling minimum uh, or, or uh, uh, zero offset section. With this stacked section, you know this is a common midpoint stack, and uh, again, it's got the uh, the first reflection, which is flat. Uh, it's multiple, uh, which is somewhat attenuated compared to the uh, zero offset section. And there's the uh, the reflection from the dipping um, interface, uh, and there's more multiples, um, and then there's the reflection uh, at the bottom from the uh, the lower flat interface. And putting it all together uh, and reminding ourselves about the, the model. Okay, so up here in the upper right, we have the, uh, the cross section, right? Distance and depth. Uh, 
and you can see all the different shot points there, and zero offset points, and and you can see that uh, you know while we have some multiple reflections, you know the uh, uh, the position of the uh, dipping reflection and the and the top and bottom reflection is um, fairly representative. Um, uh, there are some okay, and then uh, you can see how well we've done with the uh, common midpoint stack. Um, you know the flat reflectors are pretty well recovered. Uh, the dipping ones are a little broader, and uh, also you can see that the uh, there's a slight um, broadening of the stack pulses, which is a, an effect called uh, uh, NMO stretch. And also uh, you can see that the especially the dipping multiples or the multiples of the dipping uh, reflection are uh, much attenuated. So the stack does have some advantages. So let's examine this uh, um, a little bit more closely. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take that data volume, which you know now I know that the stacking chart is really just the top of the data volume, right? We've got the uh, source locations. Uh, you know they were on the vertical axis. That's now along the left side here, and on the front side, we have the uh, the offset. And as you slice your way back into this volume, you know you'll look at the different. Uh, um, the different shot gathers uh, from the different source points, you know, and, and looking at the right hand side as you as you slice in, you would be looking at the uh, you know the normal move out of those uh, reflections. You can see that the uh, so so really you know on the left hand side here, that's at zero offset. So this whole left hand face is that zero offset section. So the right, to the front face, the front right face is uh, shot gather, and the left hand face is is zero offset section. So we can identify what things are. We can see, oh, you know, this one down here, that's a multiple of this reflection here, um, and in the zero offset section, it's at uh, uh, it's at the uh, it's at twice the time. But that's not always true. Okay, at uh, larger offset, it's not always true. The dipping reflector is is kind of odd. It's uh, you can see here how it's flatter and actually displaced. Um, you know, it's in in the shot gather. It's not quite uh, uh, centered. The 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 dipping reflections hyperbola is not quite centered at zero offset. And then you can see the broader, the very broad hyperbola of the uh, of the lowest reflector. Um, you know, which is down near the bottom of the data volume. Now this is nice, clean synthetics. So you know anything that's not a strong uh, positive reflection, um, you know, can I can just show as uh, as transparent. Um, so this is just to illustrate the three D nature of this uh, of this data set. But it's you know it's three D in terms of the data set. It's this is still just a two D section in the ground. Uh, that's what it's supposed to represent. Now just to uh, uh, confirm, you know. Your um, your ideas about the uh, the three dimensionality of the uh, of the data set. Here's a um, uh, a view in in three D, you know, animated of that of that data set. Um, you know, not not prepared using any uh, anything fancy in terms of the software. Uh, so it's a little uh, a little lame here. But I think that gives you the the uh, uh, the essence of it, uh, you know, you can see the first arrival is that uh, thing that's near the top, and is a is kind of a dipping plane, and you can see the dipping hyperbolas, you know, dipping off into a larger offset. Uh, you know, there's the. Uh, let's see, so now we're looking at the zero offset section. Now we're looking at the shock gather. Okay, uh, shock gather zero offset section, shock gather. Okay. So that's the 3D nature, and then I have these other um, animations here, which are not these other pictures here, which are in color and, and hopefully uh, a little bit more clear. So, um, you know, here uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, we found this line on the stacking chart that links all the uh, all the reflection all the reflections that are from a, the same midpoint. And we can slice, you know, if we have the proper software, we can slice uh, obliquely into the data volume this way, and um, uh, that's what we're doing here. Uh, we're slicing at about um, uh, midpoint seventy-five, 
and um, <clears throat> and so this uh, tilted face on the right of the of the left hand volume is uh, this oblique face. That's that's the actual common midpoint gather, and there are you know up to twenty five traces along that gather. And you can see that the width of the gather is going to the midpoint gather is going to vary depending on which midpoint we're looking at. You know, if we're near the corner here, it's going to have very few traces. It's going to be very narrow. And in fact, uh, this corner here, the traces are all going to be far offset traces, right? They're all near uh, 100 meters uh, offset. And over in this corner here, they're all going to be near offset traces. That's all near zero offset. So that's going to add some particular bias to the data set <clears throat> that we'll have to uh, work our way around. Um, now, what I want you to notice here is that when you take uh, your midpoint gathers, uh, whether the uh, reflections, you know, still here on the left, we have the uh, uh, a bit of the uh, of the zero offset pure profiling gather, okay, uh, like the chirp survey, and so the dipping reflector in that, um, it's no longer uh, off center, and its uh, its minimum time is at zero offset, okay. When you so just by slicing it differently, you know, we we can observe what we uh, what we would hope to see, and that's. Uh, one of the reasons why we we worry about this kind of common midpoint sorting, because at least in the in these simple uh, cases here, where uh, uh, we we're getting, um, um, you know, where we we uh, uh, don't have a lot of velocity change, you know, it does make the uh, the the common midpoint gather is is simpler and easier to interpret, easier to process than the uh, shot gather. So it's uh, often well worthwhile sorting out uh, these gathers into common midpoint gathers. Uh, on the right is another example. This is one of those short common midpoint gathers that's uh, all far offset. And there's a little bit of a uh, shock gather here that's on the edge of the volume. And still on the left is the uh, zero offset gather. Um, OK, so now we want to correct away. You know, We've done our CMP, our CDP sorting. Okay, our common midpoint sorting, and now we do an NMO correction. Okay, and that's going to move the time. It's going to correct for this hyperbolic move out, the normal move out of the reflections, and it's going to put everything at the uh, at the at the same time as the zero offset reflection comes in. Okay, so now let me uh, let me illustrate that with a uh, a data set here. Um, <clears throat> And uh, this is actually the uh, same data set that you'll process in the reflection lab. Um, so um, uh, what we have here is um, you know, one record of, uh, I think it's uh, 24 channels, that is uh, uh, processed and NMO corrected into, a, uh, um, into an NMO corrected record for a particular velocity. So we have a whole, here a whole stack of different velocities. Okay, and as I move the slider up here at the top of the of the tool, uh, you know I have low velocities on the left and higher velocities on the right. And uh, when I'm at the higher velocities, you know there's less NMO correction, and so you know here, like I'm showing now with the higher velocities, that's more like what the original record looks like. And the um, and you can see that this uh, little scrap of reflection here. Has a uh, normal move out. Um, you know the the time increases with distance, um, and uh, it's hard to tell that it's hyperbolic, but that's that's the best we have. And then there's a reflection up high here, which also has uh, normal move out. It's uh, uh, hyperbolic. It's just uh, asymptotic to a, a much lower velocity. And then here's the uh, the first arrivals. Okay. Um, and uh, so uh, you know that's what the uh, the original uh, shot gather looks like too, although this is a, a, a really a midpoint gather. And so as I as I take the velocity lower, you know this is the NMO correction velocity just taken lower, you know step by step. You know now at some point, the um, the reflection down deep um, it becomes. It becomes uh, more horizontal, okay, which means that all along that hyperbolic reflection, its time has been corrected to the zero offset time, right? 
So the zero offset time is the same as the time along the whole reflection. And you can see that the, 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 all the traces have been stretched to do that. Now, if I look up higher at the at the uh, reflections that are from shallower in the section and would have uh, you know uh, much um, lower stacking velocities and they're asymptotic to much lower velocities, you know those still aren't flat; they're they're uncorrected. Okay, and so uh, you know I can mark this reflection here as as being uh, you know best corrected at two thousand meters per second, uh, which is not unreasonable. Uh, now, um, if I go ahead and I say, all right, let's try looking at it at lower velocities. To, let's try to flatten out these shallow, ref shallowest reflections. Okay, so we continue our way down. Okay, and maybe there, that's about as flat as I'm going to get on this uh, this reflection here. Okay, um, then. Uh, uh, that's at a much lower velocity of 1,400 meters per second, about uh, the water velocity. These are P wave reflections, and notice what's happened to the deeper reflection. You know, we are now stack, we are now NMO correcting at a velocity that is much lower than is proper for that reflection, and it is overcorrected. It's like going up now, and it's not going to stack in. Okay, as we sum horizontally, you know, through this record. You know these positives are gonna are gonna get uh, contrasted against that negative, and we'll get something that's closer to zero, and and the signal will not build up. Whereas this one here, you know, this negative amplitude is gonna uh, get added to that negative amplitude, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that's gonna produce a strong negative. Okay, uh, and so we'll be able to see that one on the stack trace. Um, and uh, you know I can keep going, and if I get down to a thousand meters per second NMO correction velocity, right, everything is overcorrected, and you can see they're smiling upwards instead of flat, which is what we want. So uh, you know, just animating through it a couple of times, and and you know, when we're stacking this reflection, um, we're gonna we're gonna add that amplitude to well. And I'm I'm not doing a very good job of, of picking them exactly at the same time here. Okay, so all these negative amplitudes here are going to add up, and that'll produce a strong stack trace if we can stack that reflection at that velocity. So you can see that even even you know at the same spot in the um, in the section, I mean the same uh, uh, you know place on the ground. You know, we might have shallow reflections that have to stack in at uh, uh, at low velocities, like like this one at fourteen hundred meters a second, and deeper reflections like uh, this one down here at um, uh, at two thousand meters a second. You know, that stack are stacking in at at higher velocities, and really, you know, we want to get them all stacked in at once, and that's why in the reflection lab you're going to pick velocities and um, you know, you're going to determine uh, where uh, in the shallow section, you know, you're going to pick relatively low velocities, and where in the deeper section, you're going to pick relatively high velocities, and that's to try to get all these stacked at once. You know, we can't do that with this, uh, you know, with this method, this tool alone. Uh, we can't do that. Um, we have to. Um, um, we we have to. Uh, um, uh, only identify you know one um, one velocity at each uh, for each reflector, and that's all we can all we can do. You know, so this one here that stacks in the deeper reflector uh, is not at all adequate for stacking in the shallow reflectors. So we got to adjust for all of that. Okay, so um, you know here we go at uh, just to just to remind you at. At uh, high NMO velocity correction, you know we have uh, the normal move out, the hyperbolic normal move out. You know very clear on the shallow reflection, and the hyperbolic normal move out uh, clear on the uh, deeper reflection. We go down to 2,000 meters per second NMO correction velocity, and uh, this deeper one has gone flat, and so that's the the uh, better uh, that's the better velocity for uh, for that deeper one, 2,000 meters a second. These shallower ones are still—they uh, still show NMO, you know, going down to the right in this case, 
uh, and it takes a much uh, lower velocity, uh, you know, like for this one here, 1300 meters a second, uh, or 1400 meters a second, like I said, um, to make that one flat. And the deeper one, now that we're overcorrecting, has gone into a smile. So um, uh, that's a little illustration of uh, NMO velocity correction. And uh, so part of our job, you know, once we've got the data sorted out into midpoints, and um, then we've got to uh, use that, that sorted data to, uh, uh, to guess our, our velocities. And, and I'll show you in, in your uh, reflection lab how to do that. We use a device called the, the constant velocity stack, or CV stack. So um, uh, here now are the, is the same synthetic data volume that I've been showing you with a couple of, um, of slice, oblique slices. Uh, this is uh, the uh, almost full fold um, um, common midpoint gather. And now it's um, uh, been corrected into a, uh, uh, you know, it's had the NMO correction done to it. And so all the reflections are flat. Okay. And here's that other uh, common midpoint gather at the, uh, at the midpoint at more than 100 X, 100 meters X. Um, and uh, you know, so these are these are now uh, uh, corrected to be uh, flat, okay. And so if we if we look through the this this corrected volume in the right direction, right and level, so we're going to look through it uh, along the midpoint line, right, uh, and you know we'll come down and look through it in, in that direction. Look through the volume. This is what we see on the left here. Um, and you can see that that the farther offset traces are, you know, the pulse is is broader than it should be. So you can kind of see that as a as a thicker uh, uh, plane back there. Um, so, but we have the flat the first uh, reflection, which is flat and quite strong, and we can see why now. You know, it's all going to add together pretty well. The uh, the it's multiple, which is not as strong. Um, and then the uh, notice the dipping reflection is, uh, you know, it's it's broadened quite a bit at the at the back. You know, there's kind of this fin going off it. So so being flat is not entirely uh, the right thing for for that. Um, you know, that's just just the best minimal correction we can do. The deeper reflection, you know, that's also gone pretty flat. Um, the multiple of the uh, dipping reflection is uh, you know really very spread out, and that's why it doesn't come in so strongly. Uh, in the final stack, so you know this looking along the the NMO corrected volume is emulating what we do with the final stack. Now, there's this uh, the the way that the software that you'll have works is um, that we make a uh, uh, a section that we're going to put all of our uh, all of our stack traces into, and it's uh, easiest to see what's going on here if you um, if you kind of you know, take just a little bit of the data at a time and uh, and stack that in. So this uh, uh, this record here uh, is going to be NMO corrected. You know, so this hyperbolic move out will be flattened out, okay, and um, and then each trace is put into where its midpoint goes. All right, and for this uh, particular record, those midpoints are in this interval here, and you can see the flattened reflections, like right this one here. Is uh, no longer tilted; it's flat because it's been stacked at a reasonable velocity. And then here, this reflection, which is just behind the first arrival, um, has also been flattened out by an NMO, not quite, but almost, and um, and is uh, appearing flat. And this record over here, you know, is from a different place, and so uh, its midpoints are in a in a different spot as well. So you take those two records and. Um, and you put them, uh, uh, you put them in, and, and you get your, uh, you know, part of your stack section. Okay, and in fact, that those are just two of ninety records that we took uh, that year. Um, this is a, a place near uh, in Prompt Valley, uh, west of Las Vegas, and uh, so we put all those in, and you know, the other eighty-eight records, or however many there were, and each record fills in uh, the midpoints uh, that that it has. And we can trace this uh, buried ash layer uh, 
okay, and how it's disrupted by the, the fault that runs down the middle of Pahrump Valley, which is that uh, disruption there. In fact, you can even see a little bit of this uh, uh, hyperbola, you know, which is uh, what I would call a bow tie effect. There may be two, high, two or three hyperbolas in there. You know, hard to tell because we can see the uh, um, the ash bed uh, uh, best when it's uh, when it's flat and not disrupted by the by the fault along the border between Nevada and California that runs right down the middle of Pahrump Valley. So we can see that, and um, and this is giving us the idea that uh, you know the major structure in this area is uh, uh, is right there. Okay. The ash bed disrupted by that that uh, that fault, but it took ninety records to do that. You know, each record contributed this its little bit. Um, so this is what you get when you combine, you know, pure sounding. Um, you know, but each of those ex that experiment was repeated ninety times. That sounding experiment was was repeated ninety times, um, and so then we have uh, a combination of profiling and sounding, which has enabled us to uh, determine. Uh, the uh, stacking velocity, you know, using this uh, NMO correction and and making sure things get flat, and uh, uh, then uh, <clears throat> um, stacking all the records together uh, at all the correct midpoints. Okay, so uh, uh, that's um, uh, that's in essence how the the stacking process works. Uh, just a note here. Uh, uh, this is kind of a sidebar here. Um, there's uh, in things you'll read about seismic reflection. There's always the question, you know, what is the phase of a reflection, and what they're really trying to get at is where do you pick it. And uh, you know, in classic explosion seismology or, or sledgehammer seismology, uh, you know, you pick it where the where the energy first comes out. It's first different from zero. Okay, but that's you know that point is very often lost in the noise. So um, nowadays, uh, that um, um, that kind of wavelet is processed so that you see, you know, at the at that point where you would be wanting to pick, say, the depth of a reflection, you'll be picking right on the peak energy, on the peak amplitude. Okay. So most seismic data is processed into this uh, zero phase um, um, kind of wavelet, and so you pick right at the peak. Uh, sometimes, though, uh, you find out that there are reflections that have to be picked at the zero crossing, okay? And that's a, a ninety degree phase uh, wavelet, and there's phases in between too. And then, uh, if you go to a hundred eighty degree phase, that just means you're flipping the wavelet over, okay? So what was positive becomes negative, and what was negative becomes positive, okay? So uh, just a note about phase there, and and you know. What phase your data are supposed to have, and your seismograms are supposed to have, that has a big influence on where you want to pick. Uh, you know, how where is the reflector here? Is it is it, you know, if it's not at the uh, uh, at the center of the highest peak, you know, would it be at one of these peaks? Would it be at the very first, you know, little deflection from zero energy? You know, where where would you pick it? So uh, very important to know the phase and. You know, you change the phase, and that changes a lot where you pick the the wavelet. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example of uh, of uh, you know picking uh, picking wavelets, and um, you know even though these these were hammer data, we're trying to uh, you know just identify uh, you know strong and, and laterally continuous uh, uh, phases. Okay, uh, you know that are at the peaks. So here's a, uh, a stack of this uh, data set actually in Washoe Lake um, at a uh, NMO correction velocity of uh, one kilometer per second. So this is a CV stack, a constant velocity stack. And that's a pretty low uh, velocity uh, considering that there's uh, uh, you know, 1,500 meter per second uh, water filling the pore spaces just a meter or two below the survey. And there's some very, sh very shallow reflections that that uh, that brings out, okay, and we go up to a higher velocity like 1.3 kilometers per second, and we start to get uh, you know we start to get more reflections coming out. So not only are they stronger, 
they're also more laterally continuous. You know, they're, they're, you can see them on more of the more of the traces of the of the constant velocity stack, and that's a good criterion. Now you go up to uh, 1.5, and you can see that that formally strong reflection, you know, is starting to get chopped up, and it's not so strong. It's not so continuous. So, you know, 1.5 kilometer per second is too high for that reflection. Okay. Now maybe at 1.5 there's some slightly deeper structure which is coming in a little bit better, you know, maybe down here. But this one up here is uh, is not coming in well. So, you know, it's a process of going through, and I tell you in the lab to pick, you know, at least look at at least three different columns. You know, maybe centered over here on the right or in the center, and centered over here on the left. Okay, uh, and you look at each of those columns, and you say, you know, what what velocity gets the shallow uh, reflectors in? What velocity gets you know intermediate depth reflectors in? And then, if I can see any deeper reflect reflections, you know what velocity brings those in? Okay, and usually it's going to be you know from a low velocity at the top to a higher velocity uh, down deep, and not necessarily, but uh, that's often the case. Okay, so the, you know I have to look at one reflection. And look at it at different velocities, which the, the software makes uh, fairly easy. Just have to drag that slider. And I say, all right, it's strongest and most continuous at this velocity of 1.3 kilometers per second. And so at that two way travel time and that distance across the top of the section, I'm going to make a velocity pick that is 1.3 kilometers per second. You know, that's the velocity that's going to make this uh, stack in the best. You know this. This uh, you know these other reflections maybe down below, right? Um, you know they may be uh, they may be most continuous at some other velocity. So uh, you know it's important at each point in the in the stack section, you you want to pick just one velocity, okay? Kind of each even zone of the stack section, you want to just pick one velocity. Uh, you don't want to pick that reflection everywhere it appears because you know like uh, here. At, on this 1.5 kilometer per second CV stack section, you know it's not the right velocity. Um, and in fact, most of the trial velocities that you uh, that you look at, you know they're not going to contain any of the reflections, or at least none of them will be at their best uh, correction. So, uh, you know your picks are going to be fairly sparse throughout the volume, the CV stack volume. Um, and then uh, you know if you don't uh, look carefully at your velocities and examine uh, you know how those what those velocities mean in the Dix equation right because these stacking velocities now you know you have some up high and some down below you know in these in each, so in each column you can run the Dix equation and see uh, you know is is that a reasonable velocity interval or am I you know could I be picking velocities that are changing too rapidly with time or um, you know maybe even decreasing with time too much. So you know you you refine your velocity picks and then uh, make another stack and you know like this one it's not not a great data set but we can see some layers uh, on the south side of the survey and how they're disrupted uh, perhaps by uh, uh, you know some stratigraphic variations or maybe some some structure. Uh, here's another illustration of the stacking process where we have uh, a stack section. Um, you know, which uh, is really a, a still is still a wave field, right? There's still waves in here, positive, negative, positive, negative. They have wavelengths, they have resolution that you have to calculate and pay attention to. Okay, so uh, you know here we have um, these pure sounding experiments uh, repeated uh, at many different midpoints for the uh, um, for the uh, the profile, right? And so every trace is is one of these pure sounding experiments. And uh, you know the traces are oriented vertically in here, and uh, uh, so you do this across. This is a marine survey, uh, so it's fairly clean, and you've got a you know a section of uh, of sediment here, but then there's these diffractions, okay, and each uh, in these little hyperbolic diffractions, you know that locates the uh, the terminations. That are where a uh, a layer is cut off by by a fault in this case, and the top of each diffraction, well, that you line all those up, and that's where the faults are. So, um, you know, in classical data sets, 
uh, not what I'll show you on uh, uh, for Wednesday's lecture, but in classical data sets, you know, there's really uh, very little uh, reflection from the fault itself, and you find the faults uh, in the section, you know, by the truncations of the uh, of the of the layering, and the the truncation is not supposed to be, you know, in a stack section, it, it should not be a clean truncation. Um, each truncation should generate a little diffraction hyperbola. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, to really, uh, uh, you know, and, and looking at those hyperbolas and locate, you know, connecting the tops, that's a great way to identify faults and then, uh, you know, put them into the section. Of course, you've got to also make sure that that you can make a sensible uh, structural model, you know, given the faults and how you're interpreting them. Um, but that's a that's another story, um, you know. Just in terms of creating the, the section, um, you'll you'll look at the uh, at the stack section and and you'll want to see all those hyperbolas just to just to locate the faults, or, well, just to uh, identify the faults and then to properly locate the faults and see where they really are. Um, you need to do a uh, a process called migration, and you may have heard of migrated uh, uh, data, uh, seismic data. So uh, really, the uh, uh, migration is the conversion of the stack section into a cross section, okay? And it makes these geometric corrections. You know, it migrates the reflector, the reflections around to uh, put them in their in their correct position. You know, within the within the cross section, which might still be a, a time section, uh, and that's it's often rendered that way. Although it can it can be a, a depth section. So every diffraction hyperbola is migrated up into its apex. Okay, so diffraction hyperbola becomes a point, and also dipping beds move up dip and they steepen, and that's just you know locating that dipping bed uh, more accurately. So here's an illustration of how migration collapses fault diffractions in this uh, little data set from a salt uplift uh, uh, under a, uh, a sedimentary section. The salt has caused extension in the in the sedimentary section. It's not, uh, you know, at least below a, a certain uh, uh, time, and um, you know, at, at each of these uh, fault terminations of the of the reflectors, there's a, a hyperbolic uh, uh, diffraction hyperbola. So um, migration is going to collapse all of those uh, diffraction hyperbola. And you know, turn them into their their proper terminations. All right. So then, uh, you know, while it might be helpful to look at the uh, reflection or the uh, the unmigrated stack to uh, to at least identify where you know about where the faults are, to properly you know and you know these the tops of these diffractions are broad, right? So to to really accurately find the location of the fault. You know, once you've identified the, that there's a fault in there from the hyperbolas, you look at the migrated cross section to identify really where that fault is. You know, so here's those terminations that are uh, that are in there. And the, the thing that uh, that migration can do when it works right is it can actually make your horizontal resolution uh, less than the Fresnel radius. And and in in the best cases it can make the horizontal resolution equal to the vertical resolution, you know, just as good, and that's about what's what's happening here. Uh, you know, you can see these terminations quite accurately and trace those faults. Here's another example. Um, you know, in a in a stack section before migration, we see lots of crossing um, reflections. You know, there's they're kind of what's called bow tying. You know, lots of these crossing hyperbolas. And then you migrate it, and uh, you know all of the uh, all of the dipping reflections move up, dip, and steepen. And then down here at the bottom, everything is now in its proper place, and you can see uh, uh, exactly where the salt dome is. Okay, uh, and that's very important because you know the flank of a salt dome uh, forms an excellent trap for oil and gas. So uh, you know trying to drill very carefully along the flank of a salt dome is a uh, is a time-honored way to uh, make a lot of money from that. So migration moves uh, reflections laterally to, to their correct position. 
uh, migration collapses diffractions to their to their apex, okay, and then uh, dipping events move up dip and they and they steepen, okay. Migration doesn't do anything to flat events, okay. So here we have um, uh, this uh, uh, flat basin bottom meeting a uh, 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 with a, uh, uh, a a dipping wall on uh, on the right hand side. And um, each of these, you know, the the actual end of the uh, reflection uh, has a, uh, you know, where it's terminated by a near vertical fault that has a diffraction coming from it. There's this other thing coming through, you know, sort of a it's sort of a sin form here, right? So this sin form develops this bow tie structure. There's these interfering crossing reflections, you know, that are dipping, and so migration, all right, right here. That unties the bow ties, and uh, it's migrated this dipping reflection to its proper position. And we can see, all right, you know, we can probably see the uh, uh, the end of the basin floor over here, and the and the ramp up toward the surface, right there. Now uh, that's from a, uh, a a stack section, right? Uh, if we this is this is synthetic data, we can use the uh, uh, the uh, zero offset data, and um, and so here's uh, you know this is what the stack was trying to emulate, right? Um, that's what we get in a stack section. You can see the pulses are a little bit broader, um, and in the zero offset section we have that flat basin bottom, and then there's the diffractions from it, and then uh, there's the dipping reflector which we couldn't see too well, right? In the uh, in the stack section. Uh, stacking is not, you know, not a good way of finding dipping reflections, but we can get them sort of, as you can see, we we sort of get them, and so, uh, you know, over here on the right now, the lower right, we have the ideal uh, section. You know, we can see that sharp join between the dipping uh, part of the basin bottom and the and the flat basin floor. Okay, and that's the true geometry. And up here is. Uh, how well we can get that geometry with the uh, with the stacks with the stack followed by migration. Um, later on, uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about a uh, process called uh, uh, pre-stack migration, and that's when we have lots of dipping reflectors, uh, you know, going through the stacking process, you know, and throwing away all that all that good data on our dipping reflections. Remember the stacking process, NMO, all that assumes uh, no dip. So um, you know we're really throwing away data when we when we stack. Sometimes that's uh, you know the best thing to do, and what, what we get is still better than getting nothing. But uh, you know it's the process of pre-stack migration that will get us uh, a uh, especially with land data, you know where the zero offset data is no good. Um, that can get us uh, much closer to the uh, this ideal section here that's the migrated zero offset data. So pre-stack migration is one thing we'll get later. Just for your reference, here's some equations. You know, if you're somebody gives you a paper uh, stack section, you know, like these here, and at least you can get the distance and time scales out of it. Uh, you know, what you're marked on most uh, most sections. So let's see, that's the migrated one. Here's the the stack section. You know, you might look at a certain reflector and say, okay, where is that going to migrate to? Um, and you know you can scan the whole uh, piece of paper and and uh, then put that through a migration algorithm, or you can just pick the you know two points on this uh, on this uh, line segment, you know the ends of the line segment, and you can put them through this hand migration uh, procedure. Uh, and here's the equations for it. You know we start with. Uh, uh, the endpoint locations in distance and time x zero and t zero x one and t one, and um, uh, and we want to know the uh, migrated positions. You know, x m zero t m zero x m one t m one, right? So here's uh, um, we need uh, we need to calculate the uh, slope, which is the uh, um, the the slowness uh, that we call p dt over dx. So that's T1 minus T0 divided by x1 minus x0. Okay, that's uh, you know basically one over the apparent velocity, and then uh, you know we can take one of these points um, where we've got uh, 
uh, x0 and x and t. And so the migrated time, tm, is the original time in the section, t, times this uh, radical. Inside is uh, 1 minus p squared times v squared. Got to use the velocity, of course, or assume a velocity. And then the migrated distance is um, uh, x minus uh, t times p times v squared. Okay, so uh, you know we're going to change the uh, distance. Now notice here if 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 the slope is zero, you know if it's a flat reflector, then p is zero and there's no change. You know tm is equal to t, xm is equal to x. All right, so that's uh, uh, one of the facts here again borne out by what what this is called the hand migration equations. And you know if you're presented with a bunch of data on paper, it's a Real quick way to uh, uh, to very easily see where where things are going to go. I mean, of course, you'd rather get the uh, the original data set and and uh, you know do a uh, post stack or pre stack migration even, um, but you're going to have to pay a lot for that, and so you might want to do a quick hand calculation first just to see if it's worth uh, you know if there's anything if there's enough there that that it might be worth paying to have the the processing done properly. Um, you know, big uh, big issue when you're looking at older data sets. All right, so um, uh, the next lecture uh, for next Wednesday is going to be a real world uh, set of examples of the application uh, of not just uh, um, you know NMO correction and uh, CDP sorting and, and stacking. Uh, it's going to be real world examples of. Um, um, of how we have imaged uh, geothermal reservoirs with uh, uh, mostly pre-stack migration is what we've needed because of all the steeply dipping structure in the reservoirs we've been looking at.